أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا خاتم النبيين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى التابعين والطاهرين والمسلمين وصاحب المنتجبين وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين Dear sisters and brothers, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Child, the topic today is about women's rights It is a very tough topic because there is so much abuse of women's rights in the world today And if you think about it, why do we even need to talk about this subject? Why, why don't we ever talk about men's rights, right? It's because women's rights are abused and we as men have an obligation to stand up for them. And inshallah, I'm going to start with the beginning of Sayyidah Fatima's speech when she was oppressed of her rights. And this is her praise of Allah before she started her speech. And I'm going to start with that. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yeah. Sayyidah Fatima Zahra has said, Praise be to Allah for that which He has bestowed upon us. So she said, Alhamdulillah. Even in the time of oppression, she's saying, Praise be unto Allah. And thanks be to Him for all that which He inspired and commended in His name for that which He provided from prevalent favors which He created and abundant benefactions which He offered and perfect grants which He presented. There the number is much too plentiful to compute. Bounty is too vast to measure. The limit is too much of a distance to realize. He recommended to them his creatures to gain more of his benefaction by being grateful for all the blessings they were given in continuity. So she's praising Allah and being thankful to Allah even with all the travesties that she was going through. <coughs> She's confronting the person who stole her rights and she's beginning by just being thankful to Allah for what she's been given. He ordained himself praiseworthy by giving generously to his creatures. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah who is one without partner. A statement which sincere devotion is made to be its interpretation. Hearts guarantee its continuation and illuminated in the minds of the sensible. He who can not be perceived with vision, neither be described with the tongues nor imagination surround his state. So with that, I mean, you can imagine the intelligence of this woman. She was, you know, they say, why don't we see women scholars and women mujtahids? What is this example of a great scholar? This is even greater than many of the Imams of her, her children. This is a great woman coming and confronting her oppressor. What is she telling us? When we see something wrong, don't stay quiet and hide. Stand up for the truth. Today's women's rights are being violated. I don't know if you heard what happened a few weeks ago in Nova Scotia. A young girl with the last name Parsons committed suicide because she was her rights were taken. She was raped. And the police didn't do anything. Then they took her picture and sent it all over the internet. And she said, well, there's child pornography. Look at this. The police didn't do anything. And she ended up killing herself. She said, I can't take this anymore. And we don't recommend that at all in Islam. But we need to fight for her rights. Same story. Remember last time we talked about Amanda Todd. Cyberbullying. Look what happened with the rapes of the children in India. I mean, can you imagine what's happening? One sister, we just saw her today. She said she went to Kenya. And in Kenya, she went to help the orphans, and she met the Maasai. She said the rights of women in Africa are being, it's a terrible situation. A woman, when she gets married, she has to build her own house. If she gets divorced, she loses her house to her husband. So what is this? I mean, what kind of imagination is this? And in their, in their culture, which is going on for thousands of years, is to have female circumcision, which is totally haram. I mean, where do they get these evil concepts? But if you try to change it, this is the world is very intelligent in saying they're trying to change that problem. What happens if the woman in their culture, this has nothing to do with Islam, in this African culture, if she doesn't get female circumstances, no one will marry her. 
So she's like in a catch-22. What will happen? And these are the examples of women we need to help. Now, there's something very amazing because we as men, we take it for granted, our rights. And we don't realize the women are so oppressed. We don't realize it. So, well, okay, that's nice. They're going to problem, but I have my own issues to deal with. No, that's not right. We need to do something about it. So if you give, I just want to give you a good example. Allah says in the Quran, Sulaimani, Subhanallah, Khalakal Azwaj Allah says, Glory be to Allah who has created pairs of everything. So in the beginning, Allah is telling, I have made this whole universe in pairs, male and female. There's an amazing professor, anyone has heard of this lady named Sachiko Murata, who is the wife of William Chirik, intelligent woman. She's a strong advocate for women's rights, and especially in terms of philosophy and spirituality and mysticism. She's a university professor at Stony Brook in New York, and she explains the whole universe of Allah is in pairs. It's like the yin and the yang, you know, everything is, is a feminine and masculine. And there was another professor, she was explaining about how a man may be masculine on the outside, feminine on the inside, and the women is Feminine the outside, but masculine the inside, there's, there's a balance in this universe. And if you realize some of the qualities that, you know, that we have, for example, if we're merciful, it's a very feminine quality. And she was trying to explain about the attributes. Not to say that God's attributes is of gender, no. But she's trying to explain if we try to ex use their, his examples, like Jabbar is very masculine at, uh, in terms of quality. So she's trying to explain that this whole universe, to become one with humanity, you have both, you need both. So when we take away the rights of a woman, we're taking our own rights away. And if you think of humanity, other than Adam and Eve, everyone is of a mother. Everyone, including Prophet Isa. So we're all of a mother, so that means we're taking the rights of our own mothers away. And this is a, the examples of what happened to, in pre-Islamic history. But today it's happening again. And do you know why? Why do you think there's rights being taken away, even in amongst Muslims? Ali? Why are rights being suppressed for women? Sister Sakina? I would say power. Okay, power, hunger, greed, that's a problem. Yeah, but that's been going on for thousands of years. Why is it that Muslims today are also not giving the women their rights? Maybe because they don't follow the Quran? the Quranic teachings, the basic fundamentals of Islam, we don't accept it. We don't want to. So why should I give away all my wealth to my spouse and I have to take care of her and feed her and do everything? Yeah, you have to. That's the right of a woman. It's, it's our obligation to take care of it. And what about the money they earn? Well, they get to keep it completely. You don't get a penny of that. And what's funny, I was talking to my brother, he's having a hard time getting married, his second marriage. He says, when I get married, the first question I ask is, is my wife working? Fine, she can work. It's her prerogative. But I want half that money so I can pay the bills. <laughs> You're making her work and it's her obligation? Fine. If she agrees, that's a beautiful you know, match. You can't force them. That's your responsibility. And we'll explain some of the rights that, that women have and some of the obligations that men have. And it may seem a little bit unfair. Why is there so much burden on the man that she has, he has that all these things he has to do? We'll explain why. Anyway, why some of these things are the problem in the world today? One of the things that philosophers say is, it's because of this revolutionary change when women were industrialized and they were forced to work. That's what caused all these problems. Well, these problems have been going on for thousands of years. It's not new. But that's not the issue. Why is this happening? There's two points. One, and the problem is the foolish customs, like we talk about the Maasai in Kenya, what they were doing to these unfortunate women. The cruel customs of these ancient cultures, and some of it are paganistic cultures, but some of them are not. Do you know in Europe, uh, women did not have a right of ownership? She couldn't have money, she couldn't inherit. When did it change? It started in Britain. And it happened, um, I think, about 1882, where they passed the law that women can finally have ownership. 
That just happened. Women just began to vote in the United States in the 1920s. I think in 1880, the Egyptians were voting even before that. But the rights of Islam were there from, from day one, when the Prophet came. And there are some great professors who've studied Islam, and one example is the Professor William Montgomery Watt, who died in 2006. But he was a Scottish historian, emeritus professor in Arabic and Islamic studies in the University of Edinburgh. Why I'm using non-Muslim examples to explain about Islam is, this way, well, if I say it and you say as Muslims, we have a bias. Islam, yeah, we know it's a religion of giving justice to humanity. But you're a Muslim saying that. I don't see that in, in the practice of humanity. Well, this is a professor saying, wait a second. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, can be seen as a figure who testified on behalf of women's rights. Look at him. He was a man born at a time where women were killed, buried alive because they didn't want female daughters. He was born at that time. And what did he have? He had a daughter. He did, his sons had died. He had a daughter in Fatima Zahra, which we are here celebrating her birth. Allah, 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 Allah. And then the first, uh, we call the person to accept his way of teaching the Fatima. Well, we know it's from the beginning, but say the Khadija, the first in terms of accepting his uh, message, is a woman. Not a man, it was a woman. And the first martyr in Islam who died in the way of God was a woman. The women are the ones who helped humanity, who helped this religion. Look at Zainab bint Ali. She fought for the rights of those who were oppressed. And she stood up and we love her for it. And she suffered for it. But it was a woman. What have we done to emulate that path? Very little. And we have to get up and do something. We love Imam Hussein. We cry for him. We love Ahlul Bayt. We love the Prophet. But we need to emulate him and practice him. So I was saying, why are there so many problems in the world? Because we don't follow the truth. That's not to say we're fundamentalists, they need to follow the book, the Tati. To understand the philosophy of the justice of the Qur'an is important. That's what Islam is teaching us. Okay, so now you may say, well, that's, that's religion. Today we're living in the 21st century and the rights of women are great. They get half, they divorce, 50-50, and they get a lot more inheritance rights, and they get so much more. Well, there's still a lot of things lacking. And yes, there are some things better today. But look what a woman has to go through. She has to, for example, if you look, talk to the women, they suffer a lot still. They don't get equal pay. Look what happened in Bangladesh. There's buildings collapsing. The women who are working in Bangladesh, making things so we can have today, their rights are being suppressed because of the labor laws. And it's happening in Indonesia. It's happening in all these poor countries. What happened to their rights? Oh no, there's two classes of rights, they say, those are the poor and this is the rich. There's different rights. No, Islam says every human being has rights. Every animal, every insect, every creature in this universe has rights. So there was a, we talked about him before, Nehru was the first Prime Minister of India after their revolution in India. And he was very secular. But in his last days, he was saying we need religion to establish a moral code of life. Spirituality, we need it. So people are beginning to wake up. And if we don't act on these teachings of Islam, now I'm not going to say that all religions is the right way. Because you remember the early days of Christianity, what happened? Early days of Christianity, they didn't even believe in science. Everything contradicted science. And then people say, well, I'm not going to follow this old-fashioned way of life. Don't accept that as the way of religion. Religion is very logical. Allah, who's our greatest uh, helper in this universe, who's given us everything, who's given us rules and regulations and ways of life so we can have rights, is there for us. And He's given us the Qur'an and the Prophet's way of life to emulate, to give us more rights. So women who are oppressed, it's, it's wrong for that to happen. We need to do something about it. And so we need to follow back to, to the religion of Islam. And we are the masters of our own destiny. And we may say, well, you guys are fanatics about your religion. It's not that. We are fanatics for truth and justice. If I'm being passed down some dogma that's false, and I'm going to give you an example. 
the concept of beating wives. That's nowhere in Islam, okay? They say this is Islamic. It's nothing to do with Allah. Nothing to do with Islam, nothing to do with the Prophet. This is false dogma that's passed down to us saying, oh, this is what Muslims are. We're not like that. And it doesn't say that in the Quran. I'll show it to you. But if we don't follow this truth of, of the right way of life, the logic, then it's our own failures are, are there. Okay. In modern times, we're living today in the internet age. Everybody has this little, you know, iPhone or Blackberry or something, Samsung, something in your pocket. So you're able to grasp the knowledge fast. Today we're saying we don't even need the old days you needed donkeys to get by your aircraft, fast ones. This one, what is the new one called? 782? I don't know. I lost count. They don't have the battery didn't work, but anyway, the new Boeing can fly and it's powerful. So we says, well, why bother with the donkeys of aircrafts? The mentality has become to the point where well, why bother with following this old way of life in the Quran? Well, today you have porn, today you have alcohol, you have drugs. Let's get high on life. Well, if we follow that wrong way of thinking, then we're going to be failures. Then we're going to be abusers. Look at the problems of domestic violence. Look at the crimes in jails. Everybody's uh, abusing pornography and drugs and drinking. This is a big problem. And you're saying we live in the 21st century, so internet age, so we don't need to follow morality? No. We need to avoid things that are harmful for the world. One is an example of the women being flaunted all over the place and they have no choice. They need to get a job and it's a sad situation. It's so sad. You know, I've spoken to many youth, and you guys are a lot of you in university. Ask an average girl in school, what, what job do you do right now? Do you work at Tim Hortons? No. What do you do? I'm a service provider. Service prayer, what the heck is that? I'd rather not say. And that's the sad situation. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's a horrible world out there. That they need to sell their bodies just to feed themselves and they go to school. What kind of world do we live in? This is here in the 21st century in, in North America. I mean, it's a sad world. Anyway, are women and men equal or similar? Is I the Quran, you've heard it many times. Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakara wa untha. What does that mean? Allah is saying, Oh humanity, I've created you in male and female. Does he say that I've created man and then woman part of that man from her, their rib? No, that's totally rejected in Islam. There's no word in Islam that talks about that. There is some, and I have said that we're, we're made from nafsa wahida, from one soul. From there we got its mates. But there's no higher one better than the other. This ayah proves it. Allah says something so beautiful. He doesn't say the male is better than the female. It's not a male dominated Quran or male dominated Islamic religion. No way. And neither are female dominated. It's this equality here. Allah is saying, I made male and female, tribes and nations. But he says, the best amongst you is not a race, it's not a gender, but those who are the most God conscious. Those who are living the truth of being pious. Those are the best. So Allah is trying to tell us, there is no discrimination. We don't have a God with a long beard and he's a man. We don't have that in Islam. He's absolute. You can't limit him to a gender. This is Islam, the beauty of this religion. This is why people are becoming Muslims. Out there, but there's so many of you, I know some of them here, so many of you have reverted to Islam. Why? Because it's the truth. In the books, in the teaching, it's there. Yes, don't judge the religion by the people. And if you know George and I, I'm sure he said Islam is one of the greatest religions in the hands of the most barbaric people. Why? Because we oppress each other. You know, there's a, there's a very interesting... Uh, thing going on in Hollywood. They're trying to promote movies to bash Islam as much as they can. It's in Hollywood, it's in the news, it's in everywhere you go. They're trying to bash Islam, but what's happening? People are still becoming Muslims. Why are they saying, what's good? Everything's going wrong. Everything they try, they make us look like monsters. 
And they show a picture of a Muslim and he has a terrible looking hair and he just woke up and he like rice on his beard. <laughs> I mean, they make us look like monsters and behave like monsters. But we need to think about past the situation. So, in the Akramah, the best amongst you is those who are God conscious. And now, what about the rights and responsibilities of women? They're equally proportioned to those of a man. Equality and identicalness is two different issues. We have to think about that. Man and woman are not exactly the same human beings. There's a difference. I can't have a child. None of you guys can. But women can. So we're not the same. There's differences. And there's differences in the physiology of a human being. And the doctors will tell you that. They say some cells are male and some cells are female. There's differences. So we say there's, there's equality, but there will be different obligations, different functions. So, the Qur'an teaches us that the women and men are creatures of Allah, existing on a level of equal worth and value. Equal. That's very important. There's no favoritism. They don't say that, oh, male is more important than female. Nowhere. Look at the example, say, the Fatah, who is the greatest woman that ever lived on this earth, and her mother, Khadija, and her father, Prophet Muhammad. These were role models for us, and both male and female. Khadija was a businesswoman. She hired the Prophet. She was a great role model for women today. She said, look, you don't need to be only doing housework. What if you don't have children? You can do what you want to do, as long as you and your husband agree about each other's goals and rights and functions. Everything can be very open. It's, it's a blessing today we have women working in the world. You know, look at the, the doctors. There's so many women doctors today. Look at Iran. It cannot function with the women in the workforce. So they have rights if they want to work. They're welcome. But there's no obligation. And they don't need to share that money. The man's responsibility is there. And I'll explain that. But the ayat of the Quran I want to show you is, look at the Quran. Go to any other holy book on earth of any religion. You will never find this gender equality as you see in the Qur'an. It always talks to the males, generally, in most books. But the Qur'an, it says, for example, Lo, men who surrender to Allah, and women who surrender to Allah, and men who believe, and women who believe, and men who obey, and women who obey, and men who speak the truth, and women who speak the truth, and men who persevere in righteousness, and women who persevere in righteousness, and men who are humble, and women who are humble, and men who give alms, and women who give alms, and men who fast, and women who fast, and men who guard their modesty, and women who guard their modesty, and men who remember Allah, and women who remember Allah, have prepared for themselves forgiveness and a vast reward. Chapter 33, verse 35. Look, you know, someone who writes a book, says, why bother saying men and women? You know, just say men, it means that everybody in the same batch. No, that's the beauty of this book. Allah is saying, I will not deny people their rights. Women deserve their rights, just like men. And he's our role model in terms of explaining to us how to live. Allah's teaching us how to live. In the next verse, chapter 4, verse 124, look at the way Allah explains. And he who does and, and who does good works, whether male or female, and he or she is a believer, such will enter paradise, and they will be not wrong in the dint of a date stone. So Allah's saying that they will be justice. The argument is based on the ground of human dignity being common to both men, male and female. They both must enjoy completely similar things. Islam is a religion of justice, means everybody is treated equally. However, male and females are different. You know, they're very different as people. And you can realize that when you get married, and you'll be going for a, get ready for a shock. Because you're going to have to say, well, I've never been able to deal with emotions or a man, a woman say, I can't deal with something so stubborn, you know, it's a tough battle, but they, at the end of the day, they become one when they understand each other. So there's no doubt that human dignity belong, belongs to both, but the difference is quantity is different from quality. Equality is different from uniformity. When I, what do I mean by uniformity? Similarity. Say, for example, for our, you had three children and you died. So, but anyway, one day you, this may happen to you. 
and you have a store, you have a house, and you have a farm, and you have three kids. He said, okay, I want to treat them equally, so I'll, the value of each, I'll give one to each. Did they all get similar? No. Was it equality in terms of value? Yeah, probably. So that's the toughness of life. Not all the things are the same that you can say everything is the same. If everything is the same, it's like having two robots. Everybody's the same, everyone acts the same. In the whole world, you can't even find two identical human beings on this earth. You can't. So how are you going to be able to say men and women are exactly the same? They're not. So they have different rights, different obligations. And this is what Mutahari explains in his book. He says, look, the rights are so important for women to have, and we as men need to give them their due. Every human being deserves their God-given right. And why is it that they're so oppressed? Why is it the suffering? When you go home and you see some of our parents are abusing each other. I said, what is happening? This generally happens to first-generation immigrants. Go and speak to the community. They're from war-torn countries where they saw fighting and fighting. And they come to these countries, they still don't know how to come out of that problem. So they abuse each other. They hit each other. And in terms of, you know, craziness because of anger, and they need to change and think more in the Islamic way, not their, their the tough lifestyle way. If someone who lives on the streets will learn how to be tough, but they need to come out of that lifestyle and say, wait, how am I going to be a true, kind human being? And that's what Islam gives humanity. Look at all the reverts that you find. You find them to be, they could have been like Malcolm X. He was a criminal in jail, and he came out a flower when he found his love and truth. And he was a role model for civil rights in this, in this world. So there's examples of people who change because of this, this faith. So why all the unfairness in this world today? Well, Allah says in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 187, women, the women are a raiment, how do you say a clothes in Arabic? Libas. Ribba? Libasun. Libasun, yeah. So women are raiment for the men, meaning a comfort, an embellishment, or protection for you, and men are raiment for the women. It's like you're like a clothing for each other. You're a protection for you. You are important to be with each other. You're one that makes you one with humanity. That's how important men and women are for each other. And Allah has made us all from one being. Allah says in chapter 4, verse 1. And that, that He's made from that one being, it's made. It doesn't say He's made you out of a man. It doesn't say I've made you out of a woman. He's made you from nafsul wahida. And He's created your mate from that. So, if you look at history, and I said, why there's so much oppression? This is nothing new. This has been going down from the day when Adam was born and Hawa was put on this earth. They were both put on this earth. It started that day. Anybody seen the stories of Bibi Maryam? What she suffered? Her mother made a commitment to God and says, with this child, I'm going to give this child to you and I'm going to leave this child in the sanctuary of the temple of, um, of, the, of the rabbis of the time. But what did they do to poor Maryam? They abused her. They hurt her. They made her clean. They made her work. They treated her like a dog. This is the mother of Jesus, one of the greatest women that ever lived on this earth. And did Allah forget about her? Never. Prophet Zakaria would see her, and this is in the Quran, he would see her with fruit. He says, where'd you get this? He said, oh, God gave it to me, Allah gave it to me. And he would see all these supernatural things happening to him. He says, look at this, how important you are to God. This is a woman in the Quran. There's a chapter named after Mary. What other religion has that? Islam has that, to show the dignity of women. Not to say there's no bad women in this universe. There's good and bad men and women. The wife of Nuh was a different story. The wife of Lut was a different story. The wife of Abu Lahab, you know, there's a different story. You read that in the Quran. But at the same time, there were some great women like Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh, and Khadija, and Fatima, and Zainab. I mean, there's so many great examples of both. So when we look at the beloved wife of the Prophet, Khadija, you can say that no person alive at the time was as great as her. And that's why they were a perfect match. And if you look at, say, the Fatima the Zahra, their daughter, who was greater than her? No one. The Prophet, Khadija and Ali were at the great level, but no one was greater than Fatima after that, other than my father and her, 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 
Ali. Who else was greater than her? Nobody. She was even greater than her children. Imam Muhammad al Barqa has said, <laughs> and this is to talk about her birth. This fantastic woman that was born to teach us kindness and dignity and show rights for women when they were bearing women alive. You know what's happening in China today? Today there are people all over the world as well. I don't want a, a daughter, so if I see that the child in the womb of my wife is a female, abort it. 20 million abortions in the United States. Well, if in China, there used to be one child policy, now I think it's two. But for, from 1979 to recently, it's a one child policy. Parents needed sons to work the fields. So what would they do to their daughters? Throw them on the streets. And the sad situation is just because they're a woman, they're abandoned. This is happening today in the 21st century. Can you imagine what's happening? We need to do something for the rights of humanity. Thank God there are smart and kind people who go to these countries and says, look, take these girls out of the orphanages, we'll give them a home. And they're in America. There's 80,000, they say, girls came to the United States and they were given homes. Look, there are kind people in this world. And we need to change this oppression that happens to all of humanity. So, say the Fatima was born and died at the age of 18 years and 75 days. So she was born five years after when the Prophet's first revolution came. This woman was a great woman because she would live in the life of her father and saw the revelation and helped him and helped her husband and helped this religion of Islam to establish kindness to humanity, justice for all. This is what Islam was. Now, if you look at Fatima Salam, she became a manifestation of the search of justice, especially toward the end of her life. <coughs> after the Prophet died, she maybe lived between 75 days to 95 days after he died. And what she did was what's causing revolutionary uprisings in this earth today. Even at the present time, she acts as a model for Muslim women. We need to emulate her. What a role model she is. She's the daughter of God's prophet. And if you look at Maryam, how great she was, the mother of Jesus, look at this example, the mother of the Imamat of Ahlul Bayt, that we have truth and justice on this earth, at least in knowledge and in some practice because of what she did for us. And she trained her daughter Zainab to be an example, to stand up for truth and justice and speak the truth. No matter what the oppressors were killing her family, she stood up and fought and stood against Yazid and stood against Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and spoke the truth. And they tried to kill her family and she was the protector. How did that happen? Because she grew up in the family of Fatima, the household of Fatima. Though Fatima died when she was a young girl, she saw the truth and lived it. We need to emulate that. So when we see examples of usurp, usurp, usurp people usurping people's rights, and oppression in the internal front, this is the woman we need to follow. Anyway, let's go back to uniformity, similarity. Is that what humanity is, men and women? No, there's no uniform or similarity. But there is equality, yes. The point which is worth considering that is that a man, because of sex differences in terms of gender, are dissimilar in many aspects. And it's basically because their very nature, because of nature. We can't say we're the same. We have, we're equal in terms of rights, but we're not the same. So you see people, for example, and I've told you this story before, but there are people who fight with the parliament. And they fight for, you know, these labor laws. Like, for example, after the revolution in Iran in 1979, there was so much oppression towards people who worked in factories. So much. Well, as long as there was a contract, they said, well, you have to follow the contract. This is what Islam is about, following the law in an agreement. And Khomeini is telling them, wait a second, this is injustice. Have you ever read the Quran? You cannot be unjust to anybody. And they said, well, this is the law. And, you, and the government cannot change the, these contracts. So what, what happened? These children were child law, labor laws weren't there, women labor laws weren't there, men were also working for low wages. There was not fair treatment. This is happening in Asia today. 
Indonesia today, in these small Muslim countries, Bangladesh today, their, their rights are not given to the people. They paid nothing on the dollar. Nothing. And they die doing their job just to barely survive and eat. So Khomeini said to them, if you want electricity, water, energy, then you need to follow these rules. If you don't follow these rules, then we will not give you this. What were the rules? Labor laws. That you need to treat your employees with dignity, with fairness. Forget the contracts that you're ripping off your employees. This is the time of, of truth and justice. And it began to change. Now today we're fighting with our parliament, to, you know, supposedly for justice, but there's still so much injustice going on. We as living in this part of the world say we have the right to go to these countries. And I was trying to talk to this girl who went to Kenya about can we do something to force them not to abuse their women? They said, well, they're a small town. And they sell their goods to the small areas in town. It's not like they sold to a large corporation. Well, the large corporations go to these countries and say, well, if we get, you, want, you want us to buy your goods, then... Sorry. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Anyway, I lost my train of thought. What did I say last time? How could they change it in, in small villages and Yes, areas? small countries around the world. How could we change this, this terrible injustice? The corporations just say, we're not going to buy your product anymore. And they're trying to push Nike and Reebok to do that, to establish basic labor laws. Now, let's talk about Islam and its beautiful nature to give economic freedom to women. You know, prior to Islam, in, in terms of when the Prophet came, women were treated as property. Men inherited them. They were given no rights. So when Islam came, they said, no, we cannot oppress the women. You know, for example, today, there are men who get the dowry and not the women. In many countries, like in India, that happens to some faiths. In Islam, they said, no. The woman gets the, the, the dowry, and she gets the benefit and the gifts. It's almost like, um, what do you call the contracts when the marriage ever breaks? Prenuptial agreements. It's almost like a prenuptial agreement, where this is the money you're going to get. You get it up front, and it's free for you. It always says in Quran, chapter 4, verse 4, Give to the women a free gift of their marriage portions. This means that the dowry belongs to the woman exclusively. It doesn't go to the parents. It doesn't go to their brothers or sisters. It goes to them. It's their gift. This is a wajib obligation. Now you may say, this sounds crazy that you need to give such an expensive amount of money to a, a woman. Why? Well, today they do the same thing. You know, they give an engagement ring and a, you know, a wedding ring and it's worth thousands of dollars. It's a similar concept. You have to give a gift. There's an ayat of Quran, chapter 15, verse 1, where women were complaining to the Prophet. They were pleading to the Prophet. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahim, Qad sami Allahu qawla al-lati tujadiluka fi zawjiha. This is a point where God says, I heard the women who debated with you about their husbands. And complained to God, God heard everything of the two of you have discussed, and God is here and see you. For the women of the world, Allah, God is watching. We need to stand up for the rights of humanity, but Allah's there to watch, to take care of us. He's the one who's been there for us. He's the one who gives us all our blessings. William Durant has said, the first step towards the emancipation of the grandmothers of Britain came in 1882 when they finally given rights of inheritance, they are finally given rights of, you know, getting money. Allah says in Quran chapter 4 verse 32, 1400 years ago, that men have a portion of what they earn, and women have the portion of what they earn. Look at that. Islam is giving the rights to women way before even the Europeans started. So man has to bear all the expenses of a marriage in the, to the woman. He has to pay her if she has, you know, wants a cleaning lady, if she wants to, if she decides to work, to household work, he has to pay her. Now, they can have an agreement that says, you know, I'll do it for free, and that's the beauty of a good marriage. This is look, we help each other. But he has an obligation to pay for everything. Maintenance. The woman doesn't have to do all that. All the money she earns is hers. She has a relationship uh, right, uh, obligation. Other than that, it's nothing. 
And if you think about it, when the money part of a, a family is put aside, the fights stop. When the husband knows it's his obligation, the fights begin to come and there's peace in the house. It's okay, it's my responsibility, I'll take care of it. Now, there's, if you look at Malcolm X's speeches, he's, he was telling the men, he said, look, you guys are in welfare, don't you want dignity in your home that you're taking care of your family and children? This is what we need to do in Islam. And he encouraged the Muslims to stop being on this welfare system. Go and work and feed your family. You want happiness in your family? You want children to respect you? You need to be a breadwinner in the house. Now, if you look at so many things, there's a lady named Anne Marie Schumann. She died in 2003. She was a Harvard professor up till 1992. And she compared pre-Islamic positions of women. And she said Islamic legislation meant an enormous progress for the women. And now women got rights, at least according to the letter of the law, to administer the wealth she was brought into the family and she has earned her own. This is a woman saying, look at the rights that women were finally given 1400 years ago. And this is an example of people saying what the truth of Islam is about. Now let me say something about inheritance. There's a few things, I mean women's rights, I can talk about divorce, I can talk about polygamy, I can talk about polyandry, we can talk about so many things. I'm just going to cover a few because inheritance was a problem that happened to Sayyidah Fatima. She was given a gift by the Prophet and she was denied her rights after he died by the people, by the, the people who stole her rights. But do women get inheritance in Islam? Yes, for sure. It's in the Quran. But why the differences? So I'm going to give you two stories. One, it happened that Brother Hassan ibn Tabid, a famous poet in the time of the Prophet, when he died, he had only a wife and daughters. So when he died, his cousins took all the money. They said, well, these are women. Why should we let them have it? We should take it. The women complained to the Prophet. And the Prophet conveyed to them the commandment of Allah, as revealed in the quoted verse, for men is a share of what the parents and the near relatives leave, and for women is the share of what the parents and near relatives leave. Whether it be little or much, it's an appointed share. So the women got their rights. And then you must say, well, why the differences? If you know some of the rules of Quran, it's a little bit complicated. But for example, say if there's a, I die and I have a daughter and I have a son. The son will get two times more than the daughter. So for example, the daughter gets one third, the son gets two thirds of the portion that I leave for that. You say, well, this is unfair. Why did the man get so much? Imam Jarab Sadiq was asked this question. There was an atheist during the second century that was going to the Masjid al Nabawi, Masjid in Haram, and really bashing Islam. This is during the time of Jarab Sadiq. And he says, Look at this religion of Islam. The woman gets one half of what the man gets. That's not a fair religion. What is this? So Imam Jarab Sadiq explained, and he says, According to him, and this person was saying, this is injustice to women. So Imam Jarab Sadiq said in reply, he said, this is because women was exempt from so many things. They're exempt from maintenance. They're exempt from military. They're exempt from um, dowry. They're exempt from when there is a criminal case and then the, the tribe has to give blood money. They're exempt from that too. They're exempt from paying anything. So the man of the family has to pay for everything. The woman doesn't have to pay anything. This is why that there was given more share to the, to the men and the women. But you may say, well, I'm a father, I want to give equal. <coughs> of course you can. Do you know what Islam is? It's a beautiful religion of logic. If you think about it, if you know the rules, one third is purely discretionary, you can do whatever you want with it. So I can take one third and say, the rest is divided the way I want, then I can take that one third and give it to the daughter. I can do whatever I want with it. This is the beauty of Islam. It's not as extreme as we see. Today, there's women judges in Iran. If you go to some countries, it's, it's impossible to see. Today, there's women going to judges and they're getting divorces against their husbands. That's happening today, no problem. It's happening. There's women, who, for example, who was not working and a, a job of pain, but she had divorced her husband. She got pure, all the work that she did at home, she got paid for it. So there was a proper settlement. So, Justice is happening. What happened in the last 12, 1400 years? People were suppressing others' rights. And that's not right. Why? Because maybe they are following false hadith.
this is what I really want to talk about is today we have problems and people are believing that the Quran says to beat your wives. Chapter 4 verse 34. It doesn't say that. And if you look at, um, for example, I, if you look at Muslim, Muslim Allah, Allah who just died. I'm going to give you two names of two guys who really put a lot of effort in studying. Say, Mustafa Musawi Lari, Abdul Hamid, Abu Sulaiman explained that this word, Yadribuhunna, it means to separate. I wrote a letter to Nasir Makaram. He said the same thing. It's like, Daraba fil you hit the road. It's like in English, you hit the road, it means to separate. It doesn't say, beat your wife. Where did this come from? Cover wahid, false hadith. Wrong interpretations, oppression of women is still seeping in amongst people. We need to say that's wrong. And going back to when, say, the Fatima was denied her rights, she went and spoke to um, the one who stole her rights and said, Oh Muslims, will my inheritance be usurped? O oh, son of Abu Kohaifa, where is the book of Allah that you inherited your father and I, don't, I do not inherit mine? Surely you have come up with some unprecedented thing. Do you intentionally abandon the book of Allah and cast behind your back? Do you not read where it says Sulaiman inherited the old? And when it narrates Prophet Zakaria, when he said, What he thought give me Allah, give me an inheritor? So Allah gave him a son to inherit. But the kindred by by their rights of each other, it's all book in the, in the book of Allah, and you're denying my rights? And then she turned to the Ansar. She's talking to the people, she's talking to us. She says, what is the shortcoming in defending my right? And this was a gift the Prophet gave to the Father because Allah told him to do that. It says in the Ayat of Quran, give your family their due, and he gave her this father, which was given for the, all the poor people of, the, of Medina and Mecca, and all the people suffering. But they stole this right from her. So she's talking to the Ansar. Do you understand what you do? You're usurping my rights? And what is, is that? Are you falling asleep? Are you in slumber of this injustice that's happening to me? And that's hitting me in my heart. Because when we see injustice on this earth today, are we asleep? Are we awake? Are we going to defend the rights of women in this world? And all the oppressed in the world? And all the minorities of the world? We have to. And Fatima is saying, but you are still capable of helping me. You know, we always hear this saying of Imam Hussein, Halkin Nas Yan Surna, Fatima is saying the same thing to us. You have the ability to change and do right. Are you saying the Prophet is dead and the religion is no longer? Or are you going to stand up for truth and justice? Surely she said, This is a great calamity. It's a damage and excessive injury is great. Its wound is so deep to heal. So when we see something wrong, we need to say something about it. And when we see people interpreting the Quran wrong, and this is, you know, the guys who hate Islam, they look at these books and they say, look, see, it says to beat. It doesn't say to beat in Islam. It doesn't say touch an animal, it doesn't say hurt an insect. It's a religion of kindness to the world. The Prophet didn't even hurt an insect. He was so cautious. He never hurt his wife, never beat them, nothing. Where do we get this concept? This is ignorance that tried to hijack this religion, and that's happening on earth today. People are hijacking the truth, and they're pushing down this fake dogma to us, and we say, no, we're not going to take this. Now you may see that women have always struggled for their rights in Islam. And you can't blame Islam, you can't blame God, and you can't blame the Prophet, but you can blame us. Because we are the ones that allow oppression to happen. You know, it's a common problem. Say, for example, we see a green guy walk in the room. Everybody starts saying, oh, this green guy, he's evil, he's shaitan, I'm not green, so maybe he is, because we, if we're not part of the problem, so well, it's nothing to do with me. It's just like when we see something wrong when Muslims are being abused, and we go, that's a Muslim, I don't care. We can't be like that. We need to stand up for rights and justice for everybody. For the new green Martian guy too, everybody we need to stand up for their rights. There's a lady named Mary Wollstonecraft. You may say, who the heck is that? Well, she lived in the 1700s. She's the mother of Mary Shelley. You know who Mary Shelley is? The author wrote Frankenstein. So she was a woman who lived in the 1700s who attacked gender oppression. You may say, what's the big deal about her? 
Well, she's an example of a person, till today, they're happy with what she did. She fought for educational opportunities for the women. Women weren't given a right to even learn. She demanded justice and the rights of all of humanity. She wrote a book, The Vindication of Rights of Women, in 1792. And she argued the lack of education was the big problem for the women. That's why they're you know, in trouble. That's why they're suffering. So feminist philosophers loved her. And because of what she did, you know, they pushed for rights of women. And it's still not over. There's still a lot of rights being denied to women. But we need to keep fighting. And this has been going on for thousands of years. If you're going to the times of Athenian, with Athenian women, which is past 550 BC, they weren't given rights of property. They weren't given rights of civil rights and political rights. So there's nothing new. This has been going on for a long time. But why are we not doing anything today? And I'll end with this. Why are we not doing anything? We're the representatives of Ahlul Bayt, aren't we? We want to be the helpers of Imam Mahdi, don't we? Why aren't we doing anything? Well, there's a lady who lived at the time of 717 AD. Her name was Rabia. Now, some of you who are into Irfan may know her. She's also known as Rabia al-Basri. She was a very pious Muslim woman. She fought against slavery as Islam prescribed to do so. And she fought hard against it. And she had a beautiful saying. She said, go forward with Allah. And you may say, what does that mean, go forward with Allah? Well, back to that professor Murata, who has written very beautiful books about Ahlul Bayt and, and the rules of Islam, like uh, fixed term marriage, many things. She explained, what does this forward mean? Is if you look at the, the story of Prophet Musa, when he went to the mountain and saw the burning bush, and when he put a stick in the garden, it became a snake, and he got a little bit frightened. He was a little confused what was happening. So God said to him, Oh, Musa, come forward and do not fear. Surely you are amongst the secure. Chapter 28, verse 31. What does this suggest? Suggesting that those who recognize Allah, God, will come forward to God be embraced by God and will be a fearless and secure human being. They will be amongst those who call the Quran and the Quran talks about it as the awliya, a friend of God. Surely God's friends, no fear shall be upon them nor shall they be sorrow. Chapter 10 verse 62. So the friends of God, if you want to be the, the awliya, the friends of Allah, then the friends of God will eradicate injustice on this earth through kindness, through intelligence, through learning, and be the examples of, of what Ahlul Bayt taught us to be. So, uh, Allah, 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 Allah,